For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jacqueline Motel. I am an attorney at Fox Rothschild. We are a nationwide law firm, and within Fox, I'm in our Exton office, and I am the co-chair of the nonprofit organizations practice group. So, as that title might suggest, I am uh, an attorney that practices predominantly in the nonprofit world. I assist nonprofit organizations in any tax or governance uh, needs that they might have, and then I also assist um, individuals who have charitable gift planning endeavors, and we make sure that those gifts are done in the best way possible for the biggest bang for your buck, as well as ensuring that the organization uses them, for, uses the funds for the proper purposes. So that's my background. Um, we're going to go through the 15 most common errors for nonprofit organizations today. I am happy to talk at you for an hour. But the more you guys interrupt me and the more of a conversation we can have, again, if you have specific issues with your nonprofits that you'd like to raise, please don't hesitate to speak up. I, if, I, again, I'm happy to talk at you, but I would love to have more of a conversation if you guys are up for it. I know it's a Saturday. That's fine. Um, so with that, we'll get started. The sessions today cover seven different topics. This one's um, with respect to number one, ensuring legal and ethical integrity. So why don't we start at the beginning? And now for some of you in this room, this slide might seem pretty juvenile. You say, oh my God, we were founded 50 years ago. Why are we even talking about this? Well, I like to start at the beginning because you never know, you might start your own nonprofit or you might join a nonprofit that was just founded. And so knowing the life cycle of a nonprofit from a legal standpoint, I think it's helpful to everybody. So we'll start at the very beginning, which is formation. So the number one issue we see with a lot of organizations is actually failing to incorporate as a nonprofit corporation. So we see a lot of organizations that are actually nothing more than associations, which doesn't provide you as a volunteer with the level of liability protection, personal liability protection, that incorporating as a nonprofit corporation would provide. So you see it a lot, um, I think, in the museum world. There's a lot of organizations that are, that sort of um, exist around museums, like uh, tour guides, uh, tour guide groups, those types of things, who say, oh, we're our own nonprofit. Well, in actuality, they're nothing more than an association, which is a group of people with a common interest that get together. And so it's really important to make sure that if you're a part of an organization, that you make sure that, this, that it is incorporated. Because what that gives you as a director or an officer in a volunteer capacity is limited liability under state law. So that's sort of issue number one. Item number two, failing to file is the right type of nonprofit corporation. We see this all the time. So in Pennsylvania and in most states, you can file as a nonprofit corporation as either a non-member nonprofit corporation or a member nonprofit corporation. So in the for-profit world, you have shareholders, right? There is no such thing as a shareholder in the nonprofit world because individuals cannot be owners of a charity right? And a stockholder, a shareholder, those are owners. So what do we have instead? We have this member concept, right? So members under state law are given certain voting rights, the power to elect directors, the power to approve mergers, approve article changes, approve dissolutions. So you're, if you are a member organization, you might have a board of directors and you might have all these members that you just really look at as dues paying members who can use your facilities. But it turns out that they're members under state law and they have voting rights. And you say, oh my gosh, this was not the intent at all. We see that a lot. So it's really important to make sure that in your articles of incorporation and your bylaws, it says specifically that you are a non-member corporation. Now, from the IRS's perspective, it's also important because the IRS does not like to see individuals as owners of a nonprofit, a charity. So Oftentimes, if a nonprofit or if the IRS sees a nonprofit that is a member organization that has individuals as members, they'll deny exemption and they'll make you restructure because they don't want those members having too much, those individuals having too much authority because the authority should rest with the board. Okay? The one situation where you do see a member organization that is a charity is when you create a parent subsidiary structure. So you have one member that controls the charity. So you create a parent and a subsidiary. And that's where membership organizations are typically used in my world. But the, the, 
The best example of when something goes wrong, I'm going to pick on the YMCA because I know they have a lot of members. And oftentimes, YMCAs might accidentally be organized as member nonprofits, which give their members, they might have thousands of members, voting rights. So then you have to get all these people in a room to establish a quorum to vote on something. It's just administratively obnoxious, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, making sure that your organization is incorporated in the right way, not only that it is incorporated, but that it's incorporated in the right way is fundamental to making sure that every decision your board makes is enforceable. Because if your board's operating without getting member approval on things and you have members, everything your board has done can be overturned. Not to scare anybody. I'm here to scare. <laughs> but uh, very important. Can, can I ask why? I mean, I'm a little confused. So it, an organization uh, like YMCA, yep. uh, so there are these members. What is the actual name of their, how are they organized to have members who do not have voting rights? Great question. So typically, um, those types of organizations, they will be non-member organizations that have dues-paying members that are non vote they're not members under the statutory law. What are they? They're they're referred to as members, but they aren't the members that are discussed <coughs> in the statute. So they don't have voting rights. Okay, but they have the right of membership, you know, uh, for free access exactly. or something like that. Right. So we we refer to them as associate or dues paying members. Associate. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. But for instance, my organization has members. <laughs> And the bylaws identify their rights. They don't have the right to control mergers. They do get the right to elect some board members. Okay. And so it seems to me if the, if the bylaws identify their rights, then, then we have some control. So that's a great scenario as well. So in those cases, what we typically like to see is are still articles of incorporation that reflect that you are a non-member organization. And then the bylaws provide for associate members that you as the board decide to give certain voting rights to under the bylaws. But again, those are not members under state law because the bylaws cannot remove those members' rights to vote on those other things. Because the buck stops with the members if you have true statutory members. Yeah, I know. So the last item in formation is failing to file for an exemption. Again, these things all seem probably pretty intuitive. Obviously, yes, I want my 501c3 exemption. But what we've seen with a lot of organizations is that they've never actually filed for exemption. They just file 990s every year. And they think, yeah, well, the IRS has never said anything. We're exempt. And we look them up on the IRS website and we say, not exempt, or maybe they've lost their exemption. And so making sure that you're exempt and that you retain your exemption is obviously very important because if you are not exempt, your donors do not qualify for a charitable deduction for their contributions. Can you address losing your exemption? Sure. Um, so with respect to your exemption, once you have it, you are required to file an annual 990 return with the IRS every year. You can lose your exemption automatically. It's a computer program that they use, so it is literally automatic if you fail to file your Form 990 for three consecutive years. That is the most common way organizations lose their exemption because they fail to file. Especially, um, we're seeing a lot of organizations that during COVID just kind of went into a defunct period and they didn't file. You know, everything just got sort of, oh my gosh, we got to focus on staying afloat. And these types of uh, regulatory issues just didn't get handled in the way that they would have during a normal <coughs> economy. Um, so in those cases, you actually do have to reapply for exemption. Um, and there's two ways of doing it. You can reapply and it will be prospective, meaning from the date that you reapplied. Or in certain circumstances, if you can show you know, good faith efforts to file, you know, usually, sorry, Donna, we throw the accountant under the bus a lot. Uh, saying, oh, they hired an accountant and she was crap. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and then you can get your exemption reinstated to the day it was revoked. So that's usually best case scenario. 
So, Jackie, can I just ask? Okay, so I am an accountant, and I'm the garbage that she was referring to. And what I'll She's often a good one, see huh? is a um, smaller organizations. Okay, maybe they're more the local charities, and they uh, they engage us to do. It's usually a 990 EZ, but they're a new client for us, and we'll ask them. Okay, well, can we have your bylaws, your exempt status? And it's usually a volunteer treasurer who says, well, I never got that from the other treasurer, but we've been around since 1947, and we haven't heard anything. And so what we've sometimes done is we'll reach out to Pennsylvania and see what information we can get there. But getting that application, the actual IRS approval, um, it's really hard. There's nobody at the IRS you could really call about this, you know, get on the phone with them. Um, but that, I will say that is a challenge, especially with volunteer organizations who are not aware of the compliance issues. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, I don't usually have good things to say about the IRS, but one of the things that they have made a priority recently is what they call Publication 78. Mm -hmm. It is a list of all nonprofit organizations in the United States. And if you type in your entity's EIN or its name in Publication 78, It'll tell you how, uh, when the entity was granted exemption, it'll tell you the type of entity under 501c3. So you, are you a private foundation? Are you a public charity? Are you a supporting organization? Um, it'll also nowadays, for most organizations, have a copy of that initial determination letter. And then it'll have copies of the most recent tax returns. So it's a great resource for board members, especially if you're new or you're being uh, approached by an organization to serve on the board, it, it's always the first stop for me when I'm looking up an organization is Publication 78 see what can I find out about these people. You can also see was it ever revoked? If so, when was it reinstated? It's a plethora of, of information on an organization that you can get for free. Um, and to your point, Donna, of not having the, the determination letter, that letter from the IRS, we call it a determination letter, the letter that says, congratulations, you've been issued 501c3 status, right? If you don't have that. So a lot of organizations that have been around for a long time, maybe they've just misplaced it, right? Um, what you can do is you can ask the IRS for an affirmation letter. So they won't reissue a copy of the initial letter. They'll send you what's called an affirmation letter saying you were granted tax exempt status on X date. It remains in place. And that new affirmation letter, if a donor then ever asks for a copy of your determination letter, you can use in lieu of the determination letter. It has the same weight of law as the initial letter did. And that's actually something with the affirmation letters, like you send in a fax and you get it quickly for the IRS's standards. So let's talk about governance. So you're incorporated, you're exempt, you're up and running. Governance. So this is, a lot of this is going to have to do with the, the bylaws and ensuring that your bylaws are in a good place so that you can, um, so that you can run the organization um, without any sort of hiccup. So the first thing that, that we always tell clients about um, is differentiating between ordinary decisions and fundamental transactions or fundamental decisions. So ordinary decisions are typically decisions that are made by the board that just require a majority of the directors present at a meeting, right, where a quorum is present. Fundamental decisions are those, I mentioned them earlier with respect to members, amendments to your articles and bylaws. Um, what else? Uh, dissolution, merger, formation of a subsidiary, uh, removal of a director oftentimes. For those types of transactions, um, because they're so important to an organization and its path forward, we always recommend that the fundamental transactions be approved by two-thirds of the directors then in office. And that's distinct from obviously at a meeting where a quorum is present. Because if you think about it, let's say you have a five member board. For a quorum, you have to have three people present and then two people have to vote to approve something. You don't want two out of five people approving to dissolve the entity, right? Maybe they woke up on the wrong side of the bed that morning. You want buy-in from more than just a majority who decided to show up to a meeting. So those. Uh, just making sure, again, that your bylaws have fundamental transactions that are separately outlined from ordinary business. Another item, failing to adopt a signatory policy. So we see a lot of bylaws where it just says the president can sign anything and everything. Probably not great from a checks and balances standpoint. 
right? So you want to have a signatory policy that says, and you know, you can get as crazy with it as you want. Ours is going to be crazy if you ask me. What it does is it distinguishes between different types of transactions, and then it has different value levels of transactions. So if something is of a significant value to the organization, it needs board approval before it can be signed, okay? So let's say it's a million dollar unbudgeted expense. Board approval, and then you designate who can sign it. Anything under that, maybe you can do, um, you know, particular individuals can sign at one level, and then particular individuals can sign at a lower level. So it gives checks and balances to the board to approve very large expenses that are maybe not included as specific line items in the budget. And then it also ensures that the president doesn't have unchecked authority to enter into contracts without consulting the board first. The next item, failing to include liability, limitation, and indemnification in the articles and bylaws. So these are two separate concepts. So liability limitation is the idea that a volunteer director shall not be liable for, um, uh, for the basically for anything regarding the organization unless they acted with willful misconduct or in a self-dealing manner. So you want to make sure that's in your bylaws to put the entire board and the officers on notice of their limitation of liability, right? So as long as you fulfill your fiduciary duties, you should be good. Indemnification is the concept of if, if you do get sued because of your role as a director or officer of this organization, this organization will reimburse you for your legal fees. And that will come from the organization's insurance, most likely. So indemnification and limitation of liability, personally, for me, if I'm a volunteer director, I make sure those things are loud and proud in the bylaws because I'm not serving for free without being protected, okay? So that's really important. And there's some states, Delaware is one of them, where if those provisions are not in the Articles of Incorporation, they're deemed not to exist. So if you are formed in Delaware, it is imperative that you have these provisions in your articles to protect your volunteer officers and directors. The question, do you then, in your insurance policies, do you buy an additional umbrella just for your board members? Or is that you just go with the regular? So generally, we recommend two types of insurance policies. You have your general liability insurance for your activities, and then you have what's called directors and officers liability insurance. And that's what covers your board members for the decisions they make on behalf of the organization. And then if you want to get really crazy, you can do what I do, because uh, otherwise I wouldn't sleep at night. I um, also have a personal umbrella policy that also covers me <laughs> serving <laughs> on any boards. Um, and we talked about this in the last session as well, for those of you who attended, is that if you are engaged in um, a board of, of directors that governs an organization that conducts high-risk activities, that is typically when, personally, I would get an umbrella policy. So what are high-risk activities? Anything to do with the elderly, anything to do with children, right? Those are the things where a lot of liability ends up stemming from, even though nobody did anything wrong, necessarily, right, hopefully. Um, so that's when I personally would get an umbrella policy. So I serve on a senior center board, so I have an umbrella policy, personally. That's just to protect me. Uh, are you defining children as under 18? Or? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And elderly? Uh, yeah. Let's not go there. Um. So the last item on this slide is failing to ensure proper voting methods are used. So we talked about differentiating between fundamental and ordinary decisions, right? So that's pretty simple. But then how are those votes actually taken? So in Pennsylvania and in most states, directors cannot vote by proxy. There is a prohibition on directors voting by proxy because there is a theory that if you are giving somebody else your vote, how are you fulfilling your fiduciary duties to the organization? So there's no proxy voting for directors, and online or electronic online voting is technically not allowed in Pennsylvania. It is not endorsed by the statute, so if you are an organization that does e-voting, that is technically not enforceable. If somebody were to later challenge it, I don't know how that would end 
for the organization. Because the statute provides two ways of voting. You vote in person or, you know, via teleconference, right, if you're doing a Zoom meeting. You vote in person or you vote via unanimous written consent. Email voting is not one of the two allowed voting, and a lot of people do it because it's so easy. But unfortunately, it is not technically an allowed way to vote in Pennsylvania. So can you explain the difference between a written consent and an email? Yeah, absolutely. So a written consent is when it sets out the resolutions that are being made. So the board hereby, blah, 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 blah. And then there's signature lines for everybody. So you could do it via DocuSign, right? Which is probably just yes. as simple as responding to an email, but there needs to be a written consent prepared that everybody then signs. Responding yes or no in an email to, to a one-line thing that somebody sent out is not considered an applicable way or an appropriate way to vote. It could be challenged at a later date. You never want your board decisions being challenged. Yes? What if you vote by email and then it's in the meeting minutes for the next meeting and those minutes are approved? Well, how was that in meeting minutes? Because it didn't take place in the meeting. You would, we would discuss it in the meeting. Mm -hmm. and so kind of rehab and what, I have, the what I have told clients is that if you are going to vote via email, make sure it's unanimous and ratify the vote at the next actual board meeting. Now, there's still a chance that something could happen in between the vote and the board meeting that could call into question whether that vote was valid. Um, I certainly wouldn't do it for director appointments. So for instance, if you're approving directors via email, and then are they actually on the board before the next meeting, in which case they're covered for liability purposes? Are they on the board to be sued if something happens between then and the next meeting? You know, so you're, you're not really doing your volunteer directors any favors by doing something like that via email. So if you're gonna do it via email, make sure it's unanimous, ratify it, and don't do it for things that are fundamental or for the appointment of directors. Hey Jackie, can I just share that, so we had, with an organization that I'm involved with, we had a situation, and, and it was due to a change in personnel. We had to get something unanimously approved and it was via email. It was during the summertime and it had to do with um, signature authorities with the change of personnel and everything. And you would think that that would be fairly simple to do to get, and then we were gonna ratify it. But the challenge we had was we had some board members who weren't showing up for our meetings and we did not get them off of the board. Okay, we didn't ask them to leave. And then they were the ones who, I mean, if they're not, they also didn't respond to the email either. And we spent probably about three days chasing them down. And it was either you've got to come off the board or you, you know, because we were stuck. We had no check writing authority. And it all, it all did work out, but it was the first time I've been in a situation where you take these two different concepts and put them together. And it really did, you know, for a couple of days, it held up the organization yeah. where we were going to go. Yep. Yeah. And that's actually, you know, a, a good point, too, is when you have these exigent circumstances, right, and email voting just sounds like the easiest way mm -hmm. to move forward so that you can keep continuing business. One of the things we also see in bylaws is, you know, 14 days notice to hold a special meeting. Well, special meetings are typically held when something's happened and you need to act. Mm -hmm. So we put 48 hours in our bylaws because that way you can convene the meeting, you can avoid having to chase down the people who you know are already gonna be no-shows, mm -hmm. right? And so just ensuring that your bylaws also allow flexibility to call meetings quickly when needed is really important. For calling a meeting when, when you need to do it, um, I've, I've worked for organizations where you have to publish uh, meeting dates. Oh, something. yes. Mm -hmm. So um, what uh, what are the rules for calling special? Great question. So let's assume that we're talking about a non-member corporation that we're just calling a board meeting for, right? We're not calling a meeting of the members which has special rules. So just with respect to board meetings, special meetings require you to uh, uh, comply with whatever notice provisions are set forth in the bylaws. And then if there's no notice provision set forth in the bylaws, the statute controls. So the statute's the default. Um, in our bylaws, we say, again, for special meetings, 48 hours, and that it can, the notice can be uh, distributed in person, um, via mail, or via email. 
say fax too. I don't know if you said a meeting minute or meeting notices by fax anymore, but it's in there just in case. The issue though that's interesting that hasn't been determined is whether or not email um, notice can be objected to as somebody claiming, well, I didn't get it because you don't have a transmission confirmation with email, right? I mean, in, in my organization, I could see that somebody's opened something or received it, but only within my organization. If I send something to you all, I have no idea if you read it or not, or if you got it, or if it went to your spam. So just keep in mind when you're sending email notices, uh, maybe ask for confirmation of receipt from the recipient. And if you if they don't respond to you, then reach out to each one individually via telephone and just ensure that they receive the notice, especially if you're convening a meeting to vote on something very important. Right? You don't want somebody claiming improper notice procedures. Fundraising and restricted assets. So one of the things um, we see very frequently is a failure to properly register to fundraise. So we talked about this a little bit at the last session I hosted, but there are 42 states and the District of Columbia that in addition to your 501c3 status, make you register with that state's attorney general to fundraise residents of that state. So if you are a Pennsylvania nonprofit and you want to fundraise from people who live in New Jersey, you have to register with New Jersey to do that. That is a pain in the patootie. 43 different annual registrations. If you want to do a national campaign, if you have a donate now button on your website, these are the things that we see very frequently. If you use social media to say, hey, give to our organization, who's not using social media? Who doesn't have a donate now button, right? Um, so what we typically say to clients is, let's take a common sense approach to this because usually nine times out of 10, a client isn't actually looking to fundraise on a national basis. They're looking to use social media to fundraise to make their lives easier, right? Knowing that Really, the funds are going to come from Pennsylvania and maybe a few other states. So we look at where do the funds actually end up coming from, and we register in those particular states. Another thing you can do to protect the organization is you can say on your website that you only accept donations from residents of the following states, aka those states where you are registered to fundraise. So it helps to essentially protect against a very aggressive attorney general who says, oh, well, you have a donate now button on your website. You're soliciting residents of my state and you're not registered to do so. Believe it or not, it happens. This is a cash cow opportunity for states and it is a focus of attorney general's offices across the nation because there is rampant noncompliance. So just know that it's something they're looking at and it's something that is very easy to comply with, at least on a local basis, in terms of, I have five or six states I need to register with. I'm gonna do that to protect the organization. Now, one other thing to consider with this is that once you receive a donation, so let's say you get a random donation from California, right? 10 bucks. You're not gonna go file a $25 filing for the 10 bucks. Right? Even though California law technically requires you to do so. So what I would argue about for the client in that case, if California did try to come after them, which would be outrageous, but California has done sillier things, is that they, would, they were not actively soliciting that individual. That individual found them and donated. But what you cannot do is then put that individual on your mailing list where you're then automatically sending out emails to them asking for contributions because now you are actively soliciting that individual and the argument I just made on your behalf makes me a liar. I mean, I'm a lawyer, so I'm a liar. <laughs> um, so again, just being cognizant of where the money's coming from. Are you registered in states where you get a large bulk of your, your donations? Limiting perhaps where donations can come from on your Donate Now button. And then also making sure that when, with respect to automatic mailing lists, that you're keeping those individuals who are, live in states where you're not registered off those mailing lists. We have folks who do donate from outside. And they are on our mailing list. So what I'm hearing you say is we either need to decide to get, um, to, to sign up in those states where uh, they are from, or not send them information. Correct. Okay. Yes. Do you know what the penalty is for 
healthiest and catch you? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, so last year, we were assisting a client who got assessed $7,500 worth of penalties on a $15,000 donation mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. So yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty, it can be aggressive and the filing fees are not that much to make sure they're annual, but they're like $15 here, $25 there. So, you know, it's worth it if you're getting donations in, in sizable amounts from a particular state. Yes. There's a company in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that provides this service. Harbor? I think that's. Harbor right. Compliance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, so they, they're, they tried to scare the heck out of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's <their> job. <laughs> we ended up talking to our accountant who said, yeah, you're not doing the national campaign. You know, it's not a lot of money. And and, and truthfully, I think it's going to cost us $2,000 for them to. That wouldn't surprise me. That actually seems a little low if you're going to, if you're going to operate on a national basis. Um, if you're going to do. It, I mean, the quotes that I've seen from them for our clients that operate on a national basis, it's usually around six grand to get up and running, and then maybe two for the annual renewals yeah, every yeah, year. Yeah. It's not inexpensive, so it's really, you know, you've got to determine, is it worth it for your organization? And sometimes the answer is no, in which case we take the common sense approach, which is, again, where's the money coming from? Let's make sure we're registered in those five or six states. And you know, keep an eye on it over time because maybe then you do get constituency in California and triggering registration. The other thing our accountant said was, and the people in Washington and Michigan are alumni mm. who are giving right. to the Educational Foundation. And he thought that provided some protection. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you didn't reach out to them and solicit and that they're just coming, uh, to, you. Uh, <laughs> they're coming to you. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> they knew about you before, I guess. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. So, if Tyler Perry is in California and he wants to donate to me and he sends me $100,000, can I register after? I didn't solicit it. Yeah. I can register after and be okay? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. I always take the good faith approach here. You know, it, I think it goes a long way of saying, hey, we didn't know this was coming. It came. We're going to continue to solicit him because that's going to be a good source of money. Absolutely. Yeah. Just register at that point and say, listen, I comply now because we got this unknown contribution. And here you go, California. Yeah. Yes. So um, I, <clears throat> I assume that if you have a constituency that was local, you then move retired, mm -hmm. um, and you're through through a regular, you know, social media post or email. Um, it would be prudent then to take a look at how much you're getting from Florida or Arizona. So Florida is actually the state that um, went after the nonprofit for the mailing list okay. because the first one wasn't a solicitation, and after that, it was. So Florida's pretty aggressive, California, Oregon, Illinois, and Mississippi, weird group, are, are tend to be a New York, obviously New York, uh, tend to be the most aggressive in terms of enforcing these rules. So if you have donors in those states, it might make sense to register. Again, it's not, if you do it yourself, you, you don't need to hire a, you know, um, a vendor, I think, to do this. It's very simple like a two-page form in most states and they want some governing documents and a tax return, right? It just becomes a little burdensome if you're doing 43 of them annually. That's usually when people outsource to the vendors. But you can do that for, you know, internally and then pay the filing fee. And that's a really easy way to get very low-cost protection, right, from very aggressive attorneys. Was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, so I understand taking them off your donor list, but does that mean if you're not going to register, you can't communicate with them at all proactively, like sending your annual report or et cetera? You can send stuff like that. It's just that I would highly recommend that, that those communications don't contain an ask. Right. So you can communicate from an educational standpoint, but the second you say, please donate, that's a solicitation. Okay. But on the other hand, we're told every communication should be asked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a direct versus an indirect. So the organizations that have been fined, 
I mean, are they being made a scapegoat of, or just an example, or are they really going after everyone, or is there some sort of like, are they targeting specific organizations? I, I couldn't tell you. I don't have enough information to know. I just know that it has been published that it is a cash cow for states due to rampant non-compliance. So whether or not they decide to make it a priority or whether or not they go after the big guys, uh, you know, to then scare the little guys into compliance, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what their strategy is going to be, sorry. So one other item with respect to fundraising, as if I haven't depressed the room enough, <laughs> um, commercial co-ventures. So this is a fancy name for when you go to your local pizza place and they agree to provide 15% of all sales on one night of the week to your organization. This is referred to as a commercial co-venture. Technically, you are required to have agreements in writing that legally require that for-profit organization to turn over those funds. In New Jersey, in, a, in other states, but I'll just use New Jersey for an example, you actually have to file that contract with the attorney general 10 days prior to the event. And afterwards, you have to file financial reports showing that all the money was in fact turned over. So just know it's out there. Pennsylvania doesn't really seem to enforce this, but for the organization's own sake, it's probably good to make sure there's something simple in writing requiring the turnover of the funds. Um, but if you are doing this in other states, um, check with your attorney um, your in-house counsel, whoever that might be, it's just to make sure that there aren't specific rules like there are in New Jersey that require you to interact with the AG's office when you do these types of campaigns. I know. All right, number nine, failing to issue written acknowledgement letters to donors. So I'm sure everybody, when they get a donation, they send you, or they send the donor a thank you letter. There is magic language that the IRS requires at the bottom of the donation letter that if it's missing, the donor technically can't take a deduction. And that magic language is no gifts or services were received in exchange for this contribution. There are cases where, <laughs> this is amazing, so it's a private foundation that was run by the same person who donated it. So he had to send himself a letter thanking him for his donation to the private foundation and the letter did not include those seven words. The, de the deduction of a $25 million contribution was disallowed. Yeah, so again, I, I don't think that, you know, everybody in this room would love to have a $25 million donation, right? But I don't think the stakes are as high as it was there, but it just goes to show you that the IRS strictly enforces these written acknowledgement rules, okay? And so it's important that you make sure that your organization issues the appropriate letters to their donors uh, upon receipt of a donation. Could you say that sentence again? Yeah, what's it say? Yeah, no goods or services were received in exchange for this contribution. Now the question becomes, what if goods or services were received in exchange for the contribution? What happens then? Well, in that case, so let's say an auction. We were talking about this in the last session. An auction occurs and an individual uh, bets on something worth $250, and the winning bid that they placed was $300. They have received something worth $250. So the letter says, uh, thank you for your contribution of $300. You received goods or services with a fair market value of $250. Your deduction, is, or you can deduct, or your contribution is eligible for deduction to the extent it exceeds the fair market value of the goods or services received. So in that case, the deduction is actually only $50. But you can't include that no goods or services language. You then have to say what was received and the fair, mar or the fair market value of the goods or services received. So the letter looks a little bit different when goods or services are received. I, I would imagine churches have a tough time with that one. Listen, churches They're don't bad. have to They're follow bad. any of these rules. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own way in life. <laughs> Next item, failing to identify donor designated funds, board restricted funds, and unrestricted funds. So donor designated funds are probably the easiest, right? I give to your organization, I say you can only use this to feed the homeless in Philadelphia. You cannot use my money to then feed the homeless in Malibu. Just Philadelphia. If you have determined that there are no homeless in Philadelphia and that these funds can no longer be used for the purposes for which I gave them to you, 
you have to go to court to use them for another purpose. So it's really important to make sure that if a donor designates funds for a particular purpose, you use those funds for that purpose, unless you've gotten court approval to do otherwise. You'll have a donor grant agreement, something like that, that tells you exactly what you can and can't do with those funds. Or maybe it's a will, right? Maybe somebody left you money in a will and you have the excerpt from the will that says what you can and can't do with those funds. Board restricted funds are interesting. So as a board, you can set aside funds for a particular purpose. Right? Like maybe you want to create an endowment fund or maybe you want to create a capital campaign fund and you want to put a hundred grand in there. Board designated funds are essentially nothing because at the end of the day, uh, the next board can undesignate those funds. So it's just important to keep in mind that while board designated funds might appear as a buzzword in conversations or in financial return or financials or something like that, they're actually really, from a legal standpoint, non-existent because they can be unrestricted at any time by a future board. And then unrestricted funds. So if they are not board designated, if they are not donor designated, they are unrestricted. That though is kind of a misnomer because they're still restricted based on your articles of incorporation. So your purpose clause and your articles of incorporation says, again, we exist to feed the homeless in Philadelphia. And if it stops there and it says period, you can't use those funds for anything but that. So as a best practice, what we always do for our clients is we ensure that the purpose clause in their articles is as broad as possible so as to still be accepted by the IRS. So we say that you exist for any 501c3 purpose under the sun, <laughs> including but not limited to feeding the homeless in Philadelphia. So that's your primary purpose, but you can do anything else you want with those unrestricted funds so long as they're used for C3 purposes. Now, what's really interesting, I use that term loosely because my boss always said, cool, and I said to him, let somebody else decide it's cool. Um, but, you know, I live my life like this, so now I find it interesting. Maybe you will too. But if you change your articles over time, so for instance, let's say an organization merges with another entity, and one organization's articles say only to feed the homeless in Philadelphia, and another one says to feed the homeless in Camden. Well, once those two entities merge, let's say Camden merges into Philadelphia, what do we do with those funds from Camden? Well, if it says to feed the homeless in Camden, period, and it's no broader than that, those funds are still restricted in the hands of the new entity because it was based on the articles of incorporation from the last entity. So you have to go to court if you want to unrestrict those funds. So just something to be aware of, making sure funds are used for their proper purposes. I have a quick question. So we had more discussion about doing a capital campaign and someone got excited, told one of our sponsors and they made a donation. We haven't identified it. We haven't really decided if that's what we're going to do, but we have this money. So are you saying that it's not, I mean, in well, terms I of a sponsor, it's been designated. And that's, that's what matters, is what was the donor's intent? Right. So if the donor only intended to give that money for that particular purpose, it's restricted for that particular purpose. Now, right. usually you have that in writing if you're the donor. Maybe they usually. really trust you guys. <laughs> um, but if you were to try to use that for other purposes, I think you'd have a donor <laughs> relations issue yeah. Yeah. on top of a legal issue. So we just sit, we just hold it. Right. Um, maybe we will, maybe we won't. And if we don't, we just say, here you go. Um, so if it's a completed gift, which it sounds like they've already given it and they say, here you go. If you guys decide not to do that, you actually can't give that money back to them. Um, I mean, maybe if you got attorney general and court approval to do so, but also you kind of create a tax nightmare for that individual because they probably already, they already took the deduction. Now they have to file an amended return and you know, so what happens if we don't do the project? So if you don't do the project and you're sitting on, let's say, 100 grand that was restricted for that project, you would need to go and get attorney general and court approval to unrestrict those funds for a different purpose. Well, can she just get the donor to write a letter and say it can be used for another purpose so with the mission? In, in that particular case, um, you the attorney general and the court, if the donor is still living, will certainly seek the uh, donor's opinion as to what the donor would prefer it to be used for, but the donor doesn't actually have legal authority to direct anything because it's a completed gift and they no longer own those funds. What? Oh, boy, that's crazy. Oof. 
So what are you telling me to do? Return it now? But if there's nothing in writing, it's complicated. If there's nothing in writing and the donor, you're not going to piss off the donor, then maybe redirect it for another purpose. But you know, you need to make sure there's no written trace there. Yeah. Yeah. I've been told that we must have, we we do have some restricted funds. And the accountant wants to know where is that written, yep. right? And yep. so I'm thinking, therefore, if it's not written, well, it's and not, that's it, so. What's interesting is the attorney general takes the position that if you, let's say, you go out for a capital campaign to build a new building, and you say, "I want to raise funds to build a building," and you get donations as part of that capital campaign, there's nothing in writing, but those donations are restricted for the capital campaign. So when you go out and you do a campaign for a particular activity, you always want to say primarily for the capital campaign so that if that doesn't end up happening, that building, you can use it for something else, right? To your point, because there's nothing in writing that says otherwise, except the ask. The ask is in writing. Now, if there's nothing in writing here, yeah, I think you could probably take the chance because who's the wiser? So that brings us to number 11, um, failing to use the unrestricted funds for the purposes set forth in the entity's governing document. We already discussed that. Those are the articles. Another thing to keep in mind, if your articles of incorporation and your bylaws say two different things, your articles control. So you can amend your bylaws until you are blue in the face. But if your articles say something else, you just spend a lot of time doing nothing. So making sure that you understand your entity's purpose clause in the articles is key. Because what I see a lot of times is that the articles say, um, you know, one thing and then the bylaws expand on it. And that's okay so long as they don't conflict, but sometimes they conflict. And then the question becomes, well, is this an expansion or is this an instance where they conflict and the articles have to be the ones that we follow? All right, so tax reporting. So we talked about this earlier, failure failure to file annual form 990 returns. So if you fail to file your annual 990 return for three consecutive years, you are going to be automatically revoked by the IRS, and then you pay some schmuck like me to get you reinstated. Nobody wants to have to do that. So file your returns. Pay Donna instead. Um, failing to establish the presumption of reasonableness. So this is a rule that applies to public charities. So under the 501c3 umbrella, there are different types of 501c3s. This rule applies to public charities, okay? So if you are a public charity, this rule applies to you. I assume most of the organizations represented in this room are public charities. The presumption of reasonableness is a rule that applies when you are dealing with transactions with insiders. So the most common is setting the CEO's compensation. So when you set the CEO's compensation, most of the time you're going to want to establish what is referred to as the presumption of reasonableness, that being that the compensation paid is reasonable. In order to establish the presumption of reasonableness, you need to um, have the compensation approved by disinterested directors. And that definition of disinterested is really unique because it also includes opportunities for quid pro quo situations. So, you know, hey, I'll approve this for you if you approve this for me. Um, those are not disinterested directors when it comes to the CEO's compensation. So having the compensation approved by disinterested directors, obtaining comparability data as to the compensation. So what are other CEOs of equally sized organizations in the same geographic region conducting similar activities being paid uh, for their services. So for instance, um, you know, the YMCA's um, CEO, their, their compensation should not be based uh, or compared to um, the, the CEO of CHOP's compensation, right? Because they do completely different things, okay? So it's finding similarly situated organizations, determining what they pay, and then coming up with a number for your CEO. The final um, step to establishing the presumption of reasonableness is documenting your determination and your vote. So for instance, let's say that you guys decide based on the comparability data that 150,000 is fair, but because of XYZ reasons, you're gonna give them 165. 
you have to document why you went in a different route from maybe what was the average. Okay, so just uh, approval by disinterested directors, comparability data, and documentation. Now, what does this do? So we've established this presumption of reasonableness, but what the heck does that mean? So public charities are subject to what's called the excess benefit transaction rules, meaning that they cannot provide an excess benefit to an insider. So you can only pay fair market value. So what this presumption of reasonableness does is it establishes fair market value, a presumption that that is in fact fair market value. So if the IRS audits you or flags your return for what it believes might be excess compensation, you can say, yeah, but we did all of this. And it basically puts the burden on the IRS to prove otherwise. So it's a burden shifting. So it's more of a legal concept, but it's a protection from your organization against the IRS trying to assess excise taxes because they think you're paying somebody too much. So it's an easy three-step process to make sure that you're protecting the organization against the IRS. The last two are in terms of risk. So failing to minimize liability exposure arising out of operations, real estate, related businesses, unrelated businesses. So what we spend a lot of time with, with our clients is asset protection, and that is establishing various entities to house different activities. So let's say you own two different daycares, right? Well, if the two daycares are in the same entity, somebody could slip and fall at one and come after the assets of the other daycare. So it's better most times to separate activities, most times, but sometimes it's better to separate those activities into two separate entities so that the creditors of one cannot get at the assets of the other. I say sometimes because the only thing worse than running one nonprofit is running two, right? <laughs> so you gotta weigh those costs there. And then the last item, failing to obtain proper insurance. We talked about this earlier, general liability insurance is an insurer concept everybody in this room is familiar with but then also ensuring that you have proper directors and officers liability insurance um, is very important, especially if you yourself are the volunteer director or officer, you really wanna make sure your organization has that in place. So I think we have about 10 minutes left. I'll open up the floor or you can leave. You don't have to stay in chat, it's up to you guys. Good question. If you were to do two different um, uh, LLCs to protect yourself, is it the same board running them or is it two separate boards then? It absolutely depends. So you can have the same board if that's easier for you, but then what you have to be very careful of is treating them as two separate entities. So you have two separate meetings, separate meeting minutes, separate bank accounts. You know, you have to treat them as separate even though the same people might run them. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Sorry to bum you out. Yeah. <laughs>